Welcome to the Growing Up Bananas podcast, where we discuss the perks and tribulations of being Asian. It's hard being yellow when I feel so white. My name is Ethan. Sam sits next to me, and in many ways, I sit next to him. What do we have in store today? Last episode, we discussed the first time that we saw race and how it impacted us. If you haven't already, please go have a look at it. This episode, we're talking about how we dealt with fitting in versus embracing our differences and how we do things differently if we could control or command Zed. My lovely wife, Alex, is stopping by later, which would be nice uh, to become Quan on Instagram. Let's get into it. The first thing that we might do is talk about the situation where our fitting in cherries were first popped. So we touched on it last week about fitting in and friends you know we went to schools that were predominantly white for me i was very fortunate that i had sport behind me if i didn't really have sport so thick or i wasn't definitely wasn't thick back in the day still i'm not now but if i didn't have sport that's where i made most of my friends it was a mutual you know shared interest and hobby and just being different being asian probably didn't play into my hands but being good at sport i always had that to rely on so for me, I always had playing sport as a uh, sort of safety net when it came to fitting in, especially in new schools, you know, coming to Australia, you've got your, you've got your accent, you look different. Um, kids are, you know, 12, 13 at the time, everyone's basically gone to primary school with each other. They know each other well. And here comes this kid with a ridiculous accent who claims to be South African, but he looks Chinese. And all I was good at was um, cricket and hockey, really. Didn't have too much else going for myself at that time. Terrible chat, still do, but that's it. What about you? Can you remember how you sort of adapted to or or how you fit in? Yeah, look, I'm really glad that I posed this question because I really didn't have anything. But now that I'm putting some proper thought into it, or now that I have put proper thought into it, um, I can think of a time it was in grade eight. Yeah. I think... Up till that point, I'd played a lot of soccer. I played tennis. I'd swum for a lot. Um, and it was time for our, you know, sport selection. Sport selection, I guess, for winter. And being who I am, I really wanted to play ping pong. But That's uh, something different for an Asian. <laughs> I know. I'm trying to be edgy. <laughs> oh, as we are in, in all aspects of our lives. Um, so ping pong. Yeah. yeah, I really wanted to play, but I was quite a... Larger boy, both in height and stature. Um, and girth. Mostly girth. Yeah. And I sort of got peer pressure into doing something I didn't want to do at the time, which was to play a bit of the good rugby, the rugby union. And I ended up loving it. But in the end, the initial part was due to feeling a little bit of pressure, just to, just wanting to fit in. Yeah. So you got conned or coerced into playing rugby? Well, yeah, well, like... The way that I remember how it was done, that they had a form at the front and they said, these are the sports you can play. And as we went, as they went down the list, people would call what sport they wanted to play. Yeah. And then when it got to my name, people were like, play rugby, choose rugby. So I said, okay, rugby. <laughs> and then that was it. Being a, a man of Asian descent, you were doing quite a rarity on the rugby field. Nah, there were two others. Oh, really? How'd they go? I think there were like the two other Asians in the school. Playing on the um, wing or? One was like, one literally grew to maybe 190 something oh, centimeters. Geez. He was our second row. We didn't really lose line outs. And the other one, he stopped playing after a wee bit. I think he got into other things. I remember for me, I, I only started playing or cricket hockey because my older brothers played. I thought it's because you liked balls. I do like balls. Mm basketballs golf balls any kind of ball really (laughs) but yeah so it's probably slightly different how i stumbled into sport was through brothers through family my dad claims to be quite an athletic man back in the day very hard to tell but i think i believe it yeah being different is something that we all have a little bit of trouble adapting to and it's not specific to asians it could be for whatever reason when you're in high school it sucks to be a little bit different do you know any circumstances outside of being Asian where being different might have hindered them from nurturing themselves into the best person they can be? Yeah, this is a great question. So when I first came to Australia, it sticks in my mind still vividly. 
one of my best friends during school, he was a really smart kid. And we, we came over when I was 11. So picture 11, 12 year old kids. He would answer all the questions. He was clearly the smartest dude there. And I don't think he, he didn't get picked on or anything, but I feel that he probably took a couple of backward steps um, to more fit in. He didn't want to, you know, any, any sort of being different always stands out, whether you're smart, whether you're, you're not as academically sound, all those things, it all stands out. And it got to a weird point where, I'd say weird, it got to a point when he was probably 15, 16, and it went from this guy's weird because he's smart to he's actually going to make something with himself and he's going to be a success in life too. Then that became cool. Whereas it's a strange dynamic of kids when you're cool when you're young for, you know, being the class clown and all that. And some of them don't amount to much. Some of them do. Mm. Whereas other kids um, can go with it and they sort of treat themselves and that then becomes the, the cool or, the, or the, the norm. Do you reckon that taught you anything? At the time, no. At the time, I, I mean, I was always I was always good friends with him and I supported him and all those things. Yeah, but That kind of stuff doesn't matter, does it? No, no, it doesn't. And then it's it's the recognition from your peers, which you always want most. You know, you're always going to have your friends that are going to have your back, your parents, hopefully. And now looking looking at it in hindsight, yeah, that's just everyone, probably back to your question, everyone just wants to fit in at some point. Mm. And kids go to those sort of lengths to not, you know, show their true selves. Yeah, that's something that I see a lot as well. As I've said, well, as you know, other people may not. I'm a high school teacher um, and I see this a lot. When my teaching philosophy revolves not around, you know, teaching curriculum. I mean, YouTube can do that now. You've got Eddie Wu who teaches math really well. Yeah, friend of the show, Eddie Wu. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess how I view my job is something that the computer can't do, which is to teach emotional growth so they be can, they can become sort of the best human they can be. And I just thought I'd quickly share what I see versus what, what my perception is as an, as an adult yeah. versus and as a teacher versus what the kids might see. So some of the kids that that I like to work with are the ones that are a little bit different. The ones that hold themselves back as your friend did. Um, and they hold themselves back just for the fear of looking different, just for thinking a different way. Yeah. And they think of themselves as being, you know, a sort of a social pariah of some sort. And having sort of gone through that where I've had to embrace things which haven't necessarily gone my way. It is, I try to teach them to embrace that, to roll with it and try to use those things that have been sort of shitty for them or hard for them in the past or difficult or made them different or made them stand out yeah. to, I guess, evolve themselves. And we see the people, well, I know that this is something that's said very, like pretty often, but the people that succeed most in life are the ones that have gone through all the turmoil the one that have embraced all the suffering um and made the most of it yeah interesting and you have that perspective now as an adult as a matured 100 percent. like there's no way on earth i would have seen this when i was you know sub 25 maybe even yeah and then drawing back to i guess our topic for this week being asian you know i'm never saying that it's a burden or i've had a tough life or anything like that yes you have i know i have I'm never going to say it. I just say it. But <laughs> it's like an injury. It's like mental health. You don't really know what it's like unless you're actually going through yourself. And I'm glad that we can have these conversations now in hindsight. You know, we're all mature men, some of us more than others. Um, and looking back and what we actually, what we felt versus what maybe we thought we felt at the time. So, yeah, fitting in all those things, kids, it's, it's tough out there. And hopefully some, some of our listeners can relate to a few of these points where, you know, you want to, you, you want to be true to yourself, but you also want to fit in because ultimately that's what you crave at this, at that stage of your life. Yeah. And ultimately I think we still do now. It's just not from the same sort of people. It's from people that we aspire to be like, not clowns. So then in terms of, in terms of actually fitting in, yeah. I mean, we've had these chats about, you know, different ways that we've, all different things that we've seen, whether it's about academics or the way you look or sport or how good you are, all those things. Hmm. Have you ever actually resented being Asian? God, yes. Um, In what sense? When I used to play footy, I used to go to the gym a fair bit, maybe. So, 
Um, it used to look like swimming three or four times a week. Well, I think it was three times a week in the morning. Um, gym three, four times a week as well. Jeez. I'd love to see some of these photos. Look. I'm going to get to that in a bit. <laughs> and we used to have footy training or oh, play footy like three times a week, training yeah. twice, game once. And like when I used to go to the gym, I used to, I think I was probably benching the most. Um, I, 150 was the number you might have thrown around when I first met you. Warm up, I think. Yeah. No. <laughs> when I was 17, I was doing the big 100s. Um, hey. I was... The thing that I heard from somebody was just stuck with me and it annoyed that I never researched this fact and I still don't know to this day. Are you going to blame your genetics here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't as as big as some of the other boys who were benching, I guess, in the 90s. Yeah. Um, and the thing that someone or someone said was there's Asians who don't develop muscle that quickly. Then you've got... Or at all in some instances. But carry on. <laughs> then you'd have Asian, uh, white people who grow muscle 100% quicker than you'd have the darker specimen who grow it at 200% relative to an Asian. So that kind of stuck with me for some reason and yeah. it kind of pissed me off because I think for a brief moment in time, one of my... I wanted to play... wanted to be the first Asian rugby player, <laughs> which sounds for the silly Wallabies. in it was actually for the Wallabies, but oh, back then it was back uh, then that was the, it was, it that was, was a uh, prestigious uh, achievement. What position were you for the audience? Majority of the time, it was tight head prop. Right, I did play number eight on a as a fill in once or twice. Nice, but back to the genetics thing. I think that's every Asian guy. Uh, in some form at some point in their life resents yeah. the genetics but then i think one thing that i if i could once again control or command z we saw kev last week he's jacked well yeah i mean he's defied the odds yeah so like i i don't think i should have if i could have like i said if i could control z i'd go back in time and say hey, genetics don't matter don't make excuses you weak shit just get into it do what you can do and go from there and um, what about you anyway yeah, so I mean we we've gone through this we've gone through this journey so far and it's just probably picked relayed or brought back a lot of thoughts and ideas and things that I had growing up that it evokes some weird emotions, eh? Yeah. So for me, yeah, look, to be honest, I'm happy to I'm happy and confident to say it. I probably did resent being Asian for the majority of my life. Um we've got that genetic story, we don't need to touch more on that, but just being different was always something that I, it, you just had to work with it. You just had to move on with it. Um, just, yeah, just, it's just being different. It wasn't really about being Asian. It was just being different. And yeah. again, it's not to harp on the point, but kids are that age. They just want to fit in. They just want to, they just want to have their own path, but they, they don't want to, they just want their lives to be easy. I think what is easy anyway, but yeah, just to, be unseen, I guess, or be yeah, not Be noticed. unseen, that's right. You want to blend into the crowd and you just kind of want to get on with your life. But yeah, at times, yeah, definitely probably resented being Asian. Well, then this is a probably a natural segue. Is there anything you wanted to hit on before we move on? No. Okay. So for those that are feeling that way, what would what's a way that we could sort of, you know, lengthen the process in which we want to sort of not fit in, but fit out? LeBron James. LeBron James. My man. Kevin Love, why didn't you not why did you fit out? Um I guess it all goes back to our own expectations, our own mindset. At the end of the day, once you get a bit older, a bit mature, you realize that what your peers think of you really matters zero at the end of the day. Because you zoom out and what what mattered when you were twelve, what mattered when you were fifteen, it certainly is not mattering now, you know, a couple of years later. My favorite zoom in, zoom out analogy is when you're looking at, well, when you when we think when we're at a young age, we're looking at everything through a microscope. Yeah. We see all the small details, but what we fail to do is look outside the microscope to see what it looks like on a macro level. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, so, if we did have, well, if I had advice anyway, it would be to zoom out. Don't think about the things that are sort of hindering you now or things that you feel are slowing you down. 
zoom out and think about what you want to achieve. If you don't know what you want to achieve, follow recommendations from, you know, if you've got family, you've got friends, you talk about goals. Think about it from that scale. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really important. Another sort of analogy we can use is, you know, when you were 10 years old and you were five minutes late to your piano lesson and you were just, I did it. Did you? Did you play piano? It's the one regret, one proper regret I have in life. Not I think that's piano. one of the typical stereotypes is my mum made my brother and I play piano. We can talk about this later because Mark, my brother, um, Kanye West on Instagram, I think it is. Kanye West 89. 89, you can't forget about that. He's, he's a... He's a good guy. He used to make me hide in the bushes, um, whether it was piano practice or basketball practices. <laughs> so clearly um, the tiger mum... Uh, Wait, why hide in the bushes? So that we didn't have to go to practice. <laughs> yeah, absolute menace. But anyway, we can talk about that another time. What I was saying is, yeah, piano practice, you're five minutes late. All you want to do in your life is get there because you're so late. This is the most important thing. You then look, a week down the track it means nothing school the same thing your assignments are so important you know i need sleep i need to do this who cares you go to high school same thing and it's just putting that all into perspective that right the, at that point in time things really don't matter as much as you think they do they so don't. zooming zooming out is i think that's really good advice from you that's why you're shaping the future of of australia really well look i've rehearsed these lines thousands and thousands of times thank you mr chai you're welcome, Mr. Kwan. So do you have any examples from your family which you think maybe uh, tied into this topic? Straw Hat Stephen, apologies for this. Um, On Instagram. <laughs> uh, so a long time ago, we went to an interview for a school. Yep. Um, it was a private school on the Gold Coast. Quite a prestigious one, may I add, but we don't want to mention names. Carry on. And... I don't know if I should be sharing this. I think you should. All right. Yeah, okay. Uh, so we went to interview for a school and I guess fitting in means sort of being funny. It just means sort of being a kind of larrikin, right? Yep. So then we go into this interview and then the headmaster's talking to us and he goes to my brother, what's your favorite subject at school? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, lunchtime. <laughs> now, I know you didn't go to the school. <laughs> So would you, in your educated opinion, did that cost you a spot at the school? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, there were conditions in which they said that we could attend the school, but mum was like, no, thank you. Um, Jeez, straw hat Stephen. I, I, I distinctly remember laughing and then thinking, ah, shit, afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, that's it's a good story because it then it goes back to everything we talked about is the fitting in. So he's thought that at the time that's an appropriate statement or comment to make. And Look, I don't know what was going through his head at the time, but how old was he? Do we need to, do we need to go down that path? Yeah, eleven. Oh, that's fair enough. Yeah, every well, kid loves lunchtime and in, yeah. in, when they're eleven. The fact that he cracked up afterwards though, tells us. Exactly. <laughs> Surely that wasn't the reason why. <laughs> All right, let's say it is though. Sorry, Stevie. Uh, what, let's let's hear let's hear one of your stories, Ethan. Uh, in terms of fitting in, I don't know. If you listen to any of my brothers speak, if you close your eyes, you would have absolutely no idea where we've come from. Probably me too, to an extent. But I think the accents that we've picked up have been probably more severe than they should be given the time we've actually been in Australia mm. to then to that point fit in um, top of my head can't really think of anything else that jumps out in terms of fitting in but that's probably it wow I thought we were going to throw our siblings under the bus <laughs> so another story on just in the context of brothers we love our brothers yeah so my oldest brother Daniel he Came back from schoolies up in Ely Beach with a, an eyebrow piercing. I don't think that lasts too long. Because, oh, okay. again, at the time, probably thought it was cool. It was very uh, cool. The rest of us didn't. And that went away pretty quickly. But if you know him, he's a solid guy. And it was pretty out of character for him. But kids do what they do to, to fit in. And it can be a, 
a lapse of judgment that lasts a couple of, you know, like a week. It can be a day. It can be years. Yeah. But we just hope for most people that that lapse in judgment doesn't last very long. Yeah. So, yeah. So, guys, feel free to DM us or for us some, you know, scenarios where you've done something ridiculous. Not even ridiculous, just something to fit in, whether it's related to race, whether it's related to whatever. Um, yeah, send it through. We'd love to hear some of these stories. All right, let's get Alex on. Let's do it. So very glad and privileged to be joined by my amazing wife, Alex. She's come from the room next door very far. How are you today? Good. How are you guys? We're good. Yep, same. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming on. Do appreciate it. That's right. I guess tell everyone to start off with um, your recollection on how we first met. <laughs> okay, quickly. Pretty much I posted on Blackboard, for all those who don't know what it is, it's just like a virtual <laughs> board looking for a, what's it, assignment? It was a partner for torts. No, it was, a, it was for an assignment. Yeah, it yeah, was a tort. Assignment. So we met in, so just what torts, not everyone knows what it is. It's just law. So we met studying law um, and yeah, we I was just trying to find. Together. Yeah, yes. we did. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> you didn't know that? Of course I knew that. Oh, okay. <laughs> None of this. No, yeah. anyway, yeah, just looking for a um, a few people to join a group for an assignment. And it just so happened that you responded. I think it was like the deadline, Sunday deadline. It was on a Sunday for sure. I was desperate to find someone. And you just happened to be the only person that was still available. Everyone else who had <laughs> replied to my post had already been assigned to another group. And yeah, but I'm pretty sure you thought I was a guy because my name... It's just Alex. It's just Alex. So, and then who? <laughs> who did you get to see? Ten years later, two kids and quite a lot of other things along the way. And here we are. Yeah. Yeah, nice. What are those things along the way? Well, ten years of experiences. Oh. So it's not about us today. <laughs> it's about Alex. Babies. Um. So if we then take a step back, obviously this podcast is Growing Up Bananas. What what was your first recollection? I guess the first time you realized that you were Asian. Probably in grade two, moving to a new school, and you know ESL English second language. I was sitting down reading. Like I had to read out aloud, and I just looked around. I remember looking around, and I'm going, "Why am I in this class? There were no white kids. It was just full of other race. Like um, I went to I went to a school that was predominantly like Western." Um, with also Indigenous kids and island, Islanders as well. Uh, I was like one of three in my cohort. But I remember being in this classroom and I'm just wondering like why we're reading and there's no other white kids. And then the teacher was surprised because I had to read aloud and she was just like, oh, hey, like you can speak English. And I was like, yes, I can read and write English. And she's like, oh, well, you shouldn't be here. And I think that's when I first realised like, okay, like that's that was strange. So they assumed you were less intelligent because they thought you couldn't speak English. I wouldn't say less intelligent, but maybe they didn't realize that I could speak English. They never bothered to test me or ask me questions before I went to the (laughs) school, I think. Like, they just thought, oh, yeah, she looks Asian. English is probably her second language. So, yeah, like, that's when I realized, like, because all the children that were in the class, they couldn't read and they couldn't write. And I just felt kind of... Out of place. To be fair, back in that day, it was probably a decent assumption to make. Yeah, but I mean, like... Yeah, so what are we talking, like, early 2000s? No, less, 90s. (laughs) 90s. 70s? I forget how old you are. (laughs) Good one, no. It was, like, the 90s. It was the 90s. Yeah, so you're probably right, Sam. It probably was a fair assumption. Yeah. A lot of the boat people came around that, and they were sort of either first or or not even first generation yet. Yeah, Mm. but in saying that, like, for me as a six-year-old I still felt like it's kind of out of place and I ha- and I never felt like that previously like come going from grade one to grade two a different school in grade one like my teacher was Vietnamese and I just spoke to her in Vietnamese <laughs> that's probably why they <laughs> assumed what, you couldn't speak English but it was a different school completely oh, different okay. school yeah and then I went to a yeah new school grade two but yeah that was probably my first I probably only had like two experiences one with first one was yeah in grade um two so ESL. And you're a kid at that age just realising race for the first time. Can you remember how you felt? Yeah, just out of place. Like I just couldn't explain it. Like I just, I was like, why am I here? Like just questioning it. But I guess like for me, like that's all I can 
remember. You're young. You, you don't yeah, have a lot yeah, of thoughts back then. Just yeah. thinking about it now and reflecting on it, like that's how I felt, like just out of place. But other than that experience, I never ever felt like I never belonged or anything like that up until high school. So we take a step back then. So you're, I obviously know your whole story, mm-hmm. but tell us a little about, about how your parents ended up in Australia, a bit about your background. Okay, so I'm first generation Vietnamese. My mum, really fortunate, she came here by plane, not a boat person. <laughs> she was sponsored over us, so she was really lucky. Um, but my mum came here when she was probably 16. Um, whereas my dad, whole different story. He was actually a boat person, also really young. I think my dad was like 17 at the time, 16, 17. Um, he's very blasé about the whole thing, whether or not he just doesn't want to remember it, but he came here by boat, but he was really lucky that as he was traveling from Vietnam to Malaysia, he got seasick and passed out for two days. So he couldn't remember the journey, which I think may have benefited him like quite a bit, like not having to remember that experience of being out in the ocean. It was stormy, bad weather. Like, the, you hear stories about, like, pirates and things like that. Well, he was saying that they actually got shot at um, by the Coast Guard or whoever it is. Yeah, I think that that was when they were, like, going from... Viet- yeah. Trying to, f- trying to flee the Vietnamese Trying to flee... Waters. Yeah, I think that's when he realised, okay, like, I'm not going on a holiday. So, yeah. back just to rewind, my dad thought... He, well, he was told he was going on holiday. Um, that was how his sisters were trying to get him to, I guess leave like they, they yeah had to without sort of losing the local yeah, authorities and or anything. yeah they didn't want him to know what was happening they had planned this all behind his back because they wanted they didn't want him to go to war because he was a guy he was he was a man he was male he was almost 18 so pretty much anyone who was about to turn 18 male had to enlist in the war and they didn't want that for my dad so yeah, yeah. and so anyway long story short my dad came here and met my mom and that's how you have me. <laughs> nice. It's, it's, it's a crazy story. And I always say to people who will listen to me, it sounds, remember your dad telling us a story in pretty good detail. Very, very, very heavy detail. Yeah. Um, and it seems like it's some other person's story, but it's your dad. And it's crazy that that's how he came here and he's now made himself or made something of himself. Yeah. And he's all proud of the family and that and so he should be. Yeah, so my dad's done really well for himself in terms of just going, like having a better education, going to uni, yeah. um, getting a degree. And he was really lucky that as soon as he graduated, he found a job and um, as a as a drafter for the council, for like for the Brisbane City Council, he did really well for himself. And the fact that my mom was able to be a stay at home mom, I guess back then as well, like people could afford to be like single income yeah. households. But I'm not going to lie, like, as although my parents have been here for a while, their English could have been a bit better. Yeah, and why, why would you say it hasn't improved to the level of someone else in so, the position? Yeah, so I just find that, like, a lot of the Vietnamese community, when they did come to Australia, well, from my personal experience, they all tend to assimilate. Well, not sorry, not assimilate. They don't assimilate. They don't <laughs> assimilate. Sorry, the total opposite. Yeah, they tend to try and... They build up like they build their own communities amongst themselves because I guess for them it's just to to feel like a bit more like home because they've literally fled Vietnam War and they're just trying to find comfort and the only way that they can find comfort is by finding people that have a similar background to them I guess you can say same culture yeah. same language so I find that there were a lot of Vietnamese communities in Brisbane, like there was West End and then Anala. And so I find that because they were always gravitating towards other Vietnamese people, they weren't really assimilating. Yeah. And to be honest, you were probably one of the first Vietnamese people I ever actually got to know personally. Yeah. And I was always from an, an outside perspective. I was like, why don't they just, why don't they just, you know, become more Australian? Why don't they assimilate more? But after then hearing what they've come through, yeah, you can then appreciate that yeah fair enough they want to they want a little bit of home with them yeah like they've left literally their homes their family they've left everything behind to them build a life here and i get it like you know you're in a new country you need to assimilate and like be one with the australian culture but sometimes it's hard 
you've lost everything and now you're trying to build on something. Yeah, okay. So your dad's gone through a fair bit. Like you've just shared that journey with us. Is Are there things that you think maybe psychologically or whatever your dad has been affected in his way of living now? Yeah, of course. He's a, not just him, but I see it in, amongst like all my family members. They're like the biggest hoarders. Yeah. Like hoarding it's, is... It's definitely a, an Asian thing for parents, but <laughs> yeah. you then add in the refugee status and all that, the immigration, and you can imagine it's just a poisonous soup of hoarding. Like they just hoard and hoard and they can't let go. Like crazy stories, like we'll open up the pantry. So my parents used to have like an Asian like restaurant, Chinese, res- Chinese Vietnamese restaurant. And this was like seven, eight years ago. And I'll find like sauce that's expired ages ago like 10 years ago and it's still in there my dad's like no we're not getting rid of it you can still eat it I'm like you're literally gonna die if you eat it but they just can't let go and throw things away they're not wasteful yep. um and they always like um my brother th- threw a really worn out wallet once like those old school velcro the 90s wallets. Yeah. wallets yeah yeah he like threw it Billable. in the bin Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly so my brother didn't need it and more well, outdated he like threw it in the bin and then, like, we went to have dinner with my parents one time and my dad went to go pay. My dad takes out his wallet, <laughs> opens it up, and my brother's like, isn't that the wallet that I threw in the bin? So my dad had actually fished it out. So you see what I mean? Like, my dad, my parents are like, well, not my parents. It's more so my dad. My mm. mom, I can kind of see the differences. And I think that's why my mom's a lot more understanding about why my dad hoards. And I should also mention that my dad was also not only a boat person but he was also an orphan yeah so, that's, that's really important yeah know. so him and his so my dad grew up from like a family of i think it's like eight children i can't remember the top of my head big family mm. um but lost their parents when they were quite young so my dad was actually an orphan and he was very fortunate though that he grew up in the village because a lot of children they just live on the streets but my dad and his siblings are really lucky but i think maybe that could also be one of the factors as to why they're also hoarders like they didn't grow up with anything so now they like to collect things True. and not let things go. Yeah, it's probably a show of not not wealth, but it's just a show that you have something rather than nothing. You know, yeah, which they've came with. Yeah, so I can I can understand that. Yeah. So, yeah, when we I guess when we grew up, there are always characteristics that you find a little bit strange. You're like, Dad, Mum, why are you doing that? Plastic the containers. <laughs> <laughs> They're handy. Um, oh man! In my older age. They're bloody handy. They are handy. <laughs> we you went to lunch me. today and we had a plastic container afterwards. Yep. <laughs> um, I guess the question I wanted to ask is when there are outsiders looking in, what, can you give us, aside from porting, can you give us any other examples of what um, those follow-on effects might look like to outsiders where they might go, oh, why is he doing In terms of like, so to represent the hardship that he's gone through, yeah. you sort of take it as like a token of, hey, I've been through this. This is this is what I've got to show for it. Like, do you? No, not really. Like, I think mm, my parents have really, they're not as traditional in the sense of like they, you know, face and things like that. Yeah, which like we'll a, touch on later. Like a, yeah, like a lot of people very, uh, a lot of people in the Vietnamese community, I would say, are very flashy. Like they need to show their wealth. Like they need to buy big houses and like, always Branded like one up. they always have to one up one another but my parents haven't always been like that they've always just so that's why it's hard like you know mm. like to your question there's nothing that my dad's been like oh like look what i've done for myself he's very oh. humble is that what you mean i didn't mean in the so for example like my dad yeah um, when he first came to australia um he i don't think he knew very much english but okay. the way he learned his english like his vocabulary is literally wider than mine and how he learnt all these things was just reading newspapers so there's certain words that he pronounces really strange so it's the word consequence he'll pronounce as quancy quancy and <laughs> yeah. so for me I was like dad just fix it but that's how he learned English so that's uh, okay. something people might go oh that's a little bit weird but there's an explanation for it well I guess are you talking like how they the English like how oh, no just in how general talks- I- you can't think of anything. I really can't think of anything. I mean, like, my dad... The one thing that I will say, though, in terms of assimilating, which differentiates me between me and, let's say, my cousins, is that my mum and dad, growing up in our household, it used to be, from a really young age, you have to speak Vietnamese because you can't lose that 
they want to lose that, I guess, our culture. Like, yeah. they don't want us to forget. So we had to speak Vietnamese. But then as we got older, my mom and dad kind of realized, hey, like, we live in Australia. We need to be able to speak English. We don't have a lot of Australian or white friends. So they would then actually encourage us to speak to them in English, which in hindsight is a good and bad thing. I guess their English is understandable at times. Um, well, at times. At times. There are some words I don't, yeah, I don't understand what they're saying, so I have to get them to repeat it. Um, but in saying that, um, I think it has helped them in terms of being able to communicate with my friends. Mm. Um, and, and Ethan, like Ethan's not Vietnamese, whereas like you'll see my cousins and they don't know, like their parents aren't able to communicate. Yeah. Yeah. with their partners or their friends because they can't speak English. Whereas you're a third party to translate or you just don't communicate at all. <laughs> yeah. So it's my, usually the latter. <laughs> yeah. So my parents definitely did encourage to, like encourage us to speak English to them mm. and that's probably why my Vietnamese, Vietnamese and my brother's Vietnamese isn't like amazing. Yeah. Well, on that, I mean, the topic for this podcast is embracing cultures versus fitting in and mm-hmm. I think just on the journey we've had so far, it's so important that Asians do embrace their culture and they do stay true to it. But then there's that fine line, that balance of then embracing and, you know, assimilating to the new culture because at the end of the day, there's going to be some good and bad in both. And then it's weighing up what's going to be, I suppose, most important. Yeah. So, so on that versus the, the fitting in, you've spoken about the language, um, in terms of food, or, or anything like that, other cultural traditions that you have in Vietnamese, do you personally, do you feel that it's something you want to preserve? Yes, I love, like, a lot of the Vietnamese tradition. Do I understand some of it, though? <laughs> Not really. Like, I don't really understand why we do some of the things that we do. But, like, for example, like, I love Vietnamese or Lunar New Year. It's just a festive time, family comes together, and no, it's not just because we get red pockets filled with money. Like, <laughs> but as a kid, it's exciting. Um, but like, there's like the cultural clothing. I love it, but I wouldn't wear it all the time. Like, I wouldn't wear it all the time. I'd wear it on the one day. Yes, I mean, at our wedding, you changed from your traditional white dress to a traditional Vietnamese dress. Yeah, it was. Well, in saying that, it was really important for me to incorporate the tea ceremony. But we didn't even know how to do the tea ceremony, and that kind of on reflection that actually made me really sad in a way because I felt like oh our tradition is dying like a part yeah. of our culture is dying because it's like it ended with me because I didn't know how to do the tea ceremony and yeah. neither did like my family so I think that's why it is important for me with having kids that we do also embrace like parts of the Vietnamese culture basically it's like a it's a root it's a, a compass that you can keep going back to Something yeah, like it's like ingrained in me. It's who I am. So we'll take a step back then. Mm-hmm. So your early days, school, you mentioned you went to a predominantly uh, non-white school in early primary school. Um, take us through the next part of your, I guess, your educational route. Um, yeah, so I went to, uh, we moved to the Gold Coast. Uh, again, predominantly more Westerners. Um, at the school, in my cohort, probably one of 10 Asians. Right. How many in a grade, just for perspective? Oh, like probably 120. Okay. So tiny. Um, well, a tiny contingent. Yeah. Um, and then I noticed that I didn't really fit in with the, the girls at the school. Just so it wasn't really a race thing? It was more... It wasn't a race thing. It was just more of like just what they were interested in. They were interested in boys. I was told growing up that I wasn't allowed to have a boyfriend until I was like 18. So of course for me, like, I was like, okay, that was ingrained in me. I wasn't interested in boys. They were talking about like having breast implants and things like that. At and what I, age? It was like 14. Oh, okay. So. Yeah, so, but still, that, that's really young in my opinion. It's on the Gold Coast. Gold Coast people <laughs> tend to be quite superficial. Mm, yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> That was a dig at you, Sam. I feel attacked. <laughs> you should be. Yeah. But, but anyway, I... so you, you there was there was a group of girls that you probably didn't feel 
that Kyle, comfortable with. So then, what did so then you hang out with the guys? Yeah, so I hang out with the guys. They were just more my jam, like playing handball, playing online games. Kind of geeky now that I think about it, but whatever. Then I actually moved schools. So being so again, they were pretty much all Westerners. I don't yeah. think I was really friends with any of the Asian guys. Then I went to a new school, um, McGregor, and that school was known to be like, not gonna lie, like ninety five percent of that school was full of like was Asians. Um, what were you? What was? Did you know that before you left? So I had not made it to the orientation day. My brother, my young, I've one of like one of three. So my younger brother, who was also going to the new school with me, he t- he was like, oh, like there's so many Asians at this school. Um, and I actually remember, like to this day, my reaction was, ew, gross. Because you didn't like Asians? You were scared of Asians? I was just like, ew, like Asians. Like I just had this stigma around Asians. And it's funny because I am Asian. Yes. Um, and I think that's when I kind of realized like why, like, oh my gosh, like race thing like that. You know, like that, again, hit me like really hard. Like, hey, but you're Asian. Like, why do you feel this way? Yeah. Um, but I think a lot changed when I actually went to the school and I met like a lovely group of girls. I was like six, like 15 of them. I was the 16th one and and they were Asians. And I was just like, Hey, like, you know, how's everyone going kind of thing. And I fitted in so well with them because I realized that I don't know if it's because we're Asians, but I, I'm going to say it is, but we just all had the same values and the same experiences growing up. Yeah. And I just never felt like... I don't know. I think I finally found like I felt like I belonged somewhere. So tell tell us some of these examples of having similar, you know, expectations and backgrounds and things. Mm-hmm. I know I know one was a curfew, those sorts of <laughs> things. Which did you ever have a curfew? I did what I wanted. That's really helpful right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, did you have a curfew? I didn't really go out. I liked computer games. The curfew was for getting off the computer. Ditto. <laughs> Ditto to that. But no, I think, <laughs> no, for me, um, it was, I don't know if it's because maybe I was a girl as well, but I did have curfews. I wasn't allowed to go to sleepovers. And that was one thing that some of the, like growing up, people couldn't understand, like, why can't you sleep over? Yeah. And that didn't, I never thought it was like a race thing until I actually went to McGregor, met my friends now that I'm still really close to. And they're like, oh, no, 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 like the same thing. No sleepovers, no boys, education first. And it was just great because, like, I was like, oh, finally, like, people understand me. So then I think now, I'm not going to lie, I think I gravitate more towards Asians because I find that we do hold similar values. Interesting. So I've got a question just going, rewinding just a tad. Um, when you moved to this Asian region of the of Queensland, <laughs> yeah. was that a conscious decision from your parents? Was it a business move or what was the intention behind it was it to make you fit in at your new rent in your new schooling area no not at all so funny story not to live up to the asian stereotype but i was really good at maths well was i should makes two out of three of us was very good one out of three (laughs) actually zero out of three which is actually just shit (laughs) no i was really good at maths um because i was in like the academic cohort whatever at banoa yeah one out of three then Yep. No, and my maths teacher actually recommended McGregor. He said that it was a really good school and they had a great mathematics curriculum. And yeah, so my he my like he's told that to my parents. So my parents actually enrolled into that school purely because of what my maths teacher had said at the time. Did the, is this the Vietnamese one? No, my maths teacher is Sri Lankan. Okay. So your whole family picked up and moved on this rec- one recommendation. Well, we were moving back to Brisbane, um, and it happened. Oh, you were moving. Yeah, oh, we moved, okay. sorry, and it was within our catchment as well. Why did you move? My parents for work. So they. Oh, for work. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. All right, gotcha. Then an Asian restaurant sold it, and then moved back to Brisbane for work. Yep. So then picking picking back up the timeline of, you know, the, this group of girls that you really found yourself at home with. Hmm. Um curfews no sleepovers um which is quite funny because my my parents were quite averse for me sleeping over when i was probably a bit younger yeah maybe i started touring a little bit from hockey and sport so then i'd you know i'd go stay at wherever for weeks so then that kind of went out the window but 
they were co- they they weren't actually all cool for that either when I was young. Well, like, it, but also in saying that too, like now that I think about it, my middle brother, like Anthony, was allowed to go to sleepovers. So it could just be because I'm a girl. I don't know. I think it is. Yeah, probably. Now that I think about it. Yeah. Then it also comes back to like who can be impregnated. Like that's a whole nother <laughs> topic. But no, it's it comes down to face. You know, it's yeah. always worse if your daughter is pregnant as opposed to your son who impregnates someone. So again, that's probably why. I guess with the daughter, you it's, it looks, it's more I, of a mum's responsibility. A guy can up and, and go if he really wants to. Yeah, yeah, it could be that. But I also think it's just a whole face thing as well. Like it's it's just strange. How much has that face thing affected your upbringing slash decisions you make now? Um, it's oh, a good question. My mum, I'm really lucky because I think my mum, I wouldn't say she's very westernized. She's still traditional in that sense, but face is not of a big deal to her compared to like, let's say the generation above her. So like, it was a big deal when Ethan and I had to travel to Europe, like, tra- uh, wait, no, we went to South Africa the one time and like Ethan's parents had to invite my parents out to Yamcha and ask my parents for permission for me to go. That's specifically Yamcha? It was specifically Yamcha. I didn't, in hindsight, I didn't, I maybe I was just oblivious at the time. I didn't know that's why we went. I thought it was just our parents meeting for no. shits and gigs. Well, yes, your mom wanted my parents to, your parents wanted to meet my parents so that they didn't think that you had no parents. Yeah. Yeah, and that you, you grew up in a good family. <laughs> I have family. Because, you know, they, they really loved me from the, from the get-go, his parents. No, but it was also to actually ask, <laughs> is that questionable? <laughs> no, they did. No, but it's because, um, he, yeah, no, it was also to ask so that I could go to South Africa. I mean, and my mom's actually pretty surprised that she said yes, but I think because she knew that your parents were going, my mom was like, yes. But in terms of like us going to Europe, this, like the first time, just us two together, it yeah. was a big deal. And and I guess for the audience, how long were we dating at that point? Like two and a half, three years. Yeah, so it's quite a while in. Yeah. Um, and Sam on in on our the 20s. whole. Yeah, yeah, exactly. On the whole face, um, I guess side of it, you can give examples if you want or not. But when Alex and I were dating, like we weren't allowed to sleep over, um. We weren't really able to stay out late. And me, I moved out of home when I was 17. So it's kind of free run for me. Um, I didn't really have to answer to anyone. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't grasp my head around it. And I, did, I just had no... Yeah. Uh, I had no concept of why this was happening. She's a you know a girl in her 20s and she still wasn't allowed to come out late and all that. And I get it now because I'm a matured man. And you have a daughter. <laughs> And I do have a daughter, <laughs> but yeah. but back then, like that was something that, like I said, feel free to give an example if you want to, but that was something that just couldn't really understand. It bothered you, and it did bother me because hey, you're trying to have a relationship. It's not to say you're doing this, that, or whatever. It's literally just spending time with the person you're, you're dating, and you'd been together for years, and you still couldn't get the time that you think you that you wanted, basically. You haven't asked me a question yet. I said, do you, would you like to add anything to that? Um, it doesn't have to be about you. Yeah. Maybe it's something you've seen um, when it comes to Asian parents and face and optics and things like that. Yes, Ethan. I would like to add to that. So whenever I had to, or whenever we were just chilling, you know, and then the parents came home or something, I'd have to go up and say hello regardless of what I was doing. And if I didn't, I'd get scolded. Um, there's things like expectations, like taking things over. Um, that's something that I usually do or try to do anyway. You're very good at that. One of the best. <laughs> Only one off though. It's usually just things that I like to eat. So then when it gets there, I get to eat a big portion Smart. of it before anyone gets anything. Um, <laughs> and things like... I don't know. You just feel like you always have to be on your A-game around people's parents. Otherwise, you Walking get a little bit of shells. judgment. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. And would that be for like a partner's parents or is it just other Asian parents in general? I think that's more specific to Asian, uh, like 
partners of Asian parents. But if you do it for just friends, Asian parents as well, it, like it's just being polite. You get a yeah. lot of golden points. Yeah, but I feel like for me, I don't just growing up. It, like I was told that that was common courtesy, right? But at the same time, like they say it's common courtesy, but it's all still for face because like I think I didn't want my friends' parents to think of my parents as not being able to raise a polite daughter and coming over like empty handed. So whenever I would go to my friend's house, I'd make sure that I bite, like bring something over, never empty handed, making sure I always greet them, making sure that I say my thank yous. If we're eating, always making sure that I offer, like wait till they eat first. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, me hungry. Do you still do yeah. that? Yeah, I still do that. I mean, the taking stuff over as well. Taking, yes, yeah, yeah, she she's amazing I'd at it. Thankfully, because sure I we... I forget I'm the worst. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. A lot of the times I'm awful at that, um, but I think I don't do it for face anymore. Um, yeah. I definitely do it just out of just being a good person. Yeah, yeah. kind of see, being polite. Like, like it's just yeah. yeah. But I'm not gonna lie. I do feel like guys do have it more easy compared to the girls. Oh hell yes! Like I've seen my sister go through the exact same thing, and the scolding it was is very different. Well, I guess, and it's like. You know, well, I didn't, I feel like the parents will brush it off, or the like other people will brush it off because you guys are guys. Like, oh no, it's a guy thing. Like, you know, they're not expected to do all that, but the, as a female, yeah, you ha- you have to do it. Yeah, just just on that, where you brought up about you would you feel like their parents would judge your parents? Is that is that actually like something? Is it just something implied that you picked up, or have you ever actually heard it? Like, where did that come from? I think it's all implied because of face. I've that's heard what it. Fa- that's, I've never heard it. But I have I actually heard implied. it. Yeah, I've heard it. But and a lot of the time, it's not even. It doesn't even have to be verbal. It's you see non-verbal signs as well. A few size, not not so much size, but I think with Asians, it's in the body language, probably. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, as meant, to, I was going to say when we went to Europe and the whole big deal thing. It wasn't such a big deal for my mum in the sense that, like, she's like, you know what, like, I'm old enough, you should be able to go. It's because she was being, my mum was told off, like, scolded by her elders. Like, what do you think? Like, how do you think it looks? Like, your daughter, not married. She's, like, going off with this guy. Even though, like, it doesn't matter that we've been together for, like, two and a half, three years or whatever. Like, it just looked bad. Yeah. So, so, so like, any of our white, it was a big deal. Any of our white friends listening, they're just... Have same easy. as me I feel like they have an easy the, we're, we're bananas yeah. they're just thinking what the fuck's going on like yeah. there's no way if, if you real. told one of your friends that <laughs> you, they'd laugh at us yeah. yeah and that's the sort of things we had to go through and you can't like respect like there's no way to respect respectfully be like yes I hear what you're saying but but like I'm gonna go anyway we did though <laughs> we did <laughs> did you not out of spite it's just we we wanted to go on a European trip together yeah I wanted to like, meet my family, like, in Europe. Like, we have family there that I wanted to meet. But so. you're Asian. Why are they in Europe? That's a whole other story. It really is. <laughs> it really there. is. Um, I, I'd like to stay on, like, the, the family pressure things before I move on. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything else that you felt? So it may not it may not sort of be around the face, but family pressures of being a girl. Is there anything else you can think of that was specific to you? that may not have been actually said, but you felt you had to do, whether it was, you know, a certain way you had to be educated, a certain um, way you had to look, whatever it may be. Is there anything else you have? Yeah, definitely. So now that we're married, I, I'm i like in my 30s. Oh, just turned 30, I should say, <laughs> but I'm in my 30s. And I'm still being lectured by my mom of how I should be as a wife. Like, it's so old school. We should listen to her sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up rude. No. I don't know what you're saying, so I could just shoot myself in the foot here. Yes. It's like for example, like, you know, like like remaining appealing. Like having to dress up when I'm at home. I've, I've told you that it's so unnecessary. Yeah, but my mum's like, no, like you want to stay attractive to your husband. You he, like you don't want them to be led astray by like prettier young, prettier things. So it's just upholding how I like look. Yeah, it's just like those things, like pleasing. <laughs> I should, I say pleasing, but like not 
We've been married almost could like five be, years. I feel, I feel, like, I feel like you can say pleasing. I mean, it could be sexually. <laughs> I don't know. But like, for example, like wearing nice lingerie, but I'm like, hey, I'm in my comfy gear. Like, I don't need to impress nobody. Like, yeah. have you seen my buddy? Just saying. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Okay, this has taken a whole different turn. No, but, but just things yeah. like that. Like, just So your mom's still on your case. Yeah, to make And you're, sh- you're in your 30s, you've got two kids, you're married, and, we're and five she's still years on your into case. It, yeah, and my mum still, like, makes sure that you, like, do these things, like, for your for your marriage kind of thing. Um, what else is there? Oh, and because I live with my in-laws, it's just making sure that I always listen to them. Like, you know, like, be respectful of them. If they, if I'm cleaning or wanting to throw things away and it doesn't belong to me, making sure that I ask them. Throw that. it away. We have so much things. Chuck so it. much crap. The hoarding? Chuck it. The hoarding It's that thing? hoarding mentality. My, my parents like, no, we're not hoarders. You go to our garage. There's stuff that hasn't been unboxed for two years. Yeah, that's sauna as well. Get rid of it. I'll take it. No, <laughs> it's definitely stay. But, you know, like, yeah, so there are still a few more pressures because I am the female. Like, even when we're going away, like, I don't know. I just feel like my mom's like, you know, Ethan can be excused, but you can't kind of thing. It's not my mom, but I know what you mean. Yeah. And then I guess on the next step, have you felt any pressure as a mom from your, not not from your parents because your parents are so supportive of us and everything, mm. but more from just face. Have you felt any pressure as a mom? No, but I definitely feel like I've been put on a pedal stool by my family. How so? Being like, I'm not going to lie, like I'm the second, like second eldest of my generation um and like i'm like graduated uni have a career have got me <laughs> yeah, the got ultimate Ethan. trophy yeah <laughs> no yeah yeah no i'm married and i have kids and like to I them we should just take a moment to appreciate ethan <laughs> we all should i do it all the time it's fine. <laughs> just a moment of silence <laughs> not dying but no, carry on. Just, so, to, just wow. So for like, so for a lot of my family, I think they think that it's the perfect life, and I, and I'm so grateful for where I am, and it's what we wanted. Like that's what we yeah. wanted in life, um, and like life, it's still a roller coaster, you know. But I am put on a pedestal by my family because they think, oh, she has everything, and this is what you should all be aiming for: getting my license. Again, at the tender I, age of like 23. Yeah, I got my license at 23 and all my cousins and siblings. <laughs> not even here. Yeah, oh, I'm not even kidding. All, and you were the first in the family. I was it? the first in my family. And so all my youngest like siblings and like cousins were just like, oh, we need to beat Alex. Yeah, yeah. Alex at 23. At 23. I'm like, guys, I'm not. <laughs> your family? I was, yeah, I was like, don't aim to like, I'm like, it's not a competition. But again, it's just. I was always just put on the this pedal stool because maybe I was the oldest. I don't know, old, old second, yeah. So we've really we've never really spoken about it, but do you feel pressure because you know you're on this pedestal that you can't slip up? Not really. I I don't really care much about face. Yeah. Like, uh, not to that extent. Like, I just I am so chill that I just it's like it's my life. I'm gonna do what I want to do. Yep. You go, girl. On a, on a slightly separate topic, but I guess it still remains the same. Do you feel like a lot of other girls your age or in your position don't, I don't want to say act up because everyone does what they want to do, but mm-hmm. don't deviate too far away from what's considered ideal because of pressure from family? Mm, I'm like trying to think friends. I don't know. I have... No, I don't think... Like, I guess more... Probably an easy way to rephrase it is being an Asian woman, do you feel that there's pressure to do the right thing for the family? For me personally? No, just in general. Yeah, I think so. I think there's more... Definitely more pressure compared to, like, the guys. And I see it more from my friends. Well, you guys can't become tradies. No, can't become tradies. Have to have respectable jobs. Yeah, but you're saying that traders are not respectable jobs. Well, I'm not saying that, but that's perception. perception. Okay, yeah. Um, really, they're richer than all of us. I really want to be a are. tradie, though. Me I'd too. be useless, but hey, I want to get but my hands tax dirty. Deductions. <laughs> um, I guess one thing that I think I sort of understand from where you what you've told us so far. I think I understand, but in your upbringing, did you think you had a strip 
strict upbringing? Uh, in some ways, yes. And in some ways, not really. So, don't even know if that's... We, we'll talk, I, talk about the ways you think you did first then. Okay, so strict again, like no boys. Um, Is know. that strict though? Like if you had a boyfriend at say 15, like... Or was it just something you would never entertain? Never entertain. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, I was just like, thinking. Your mom's gonna, my friends going to contradict me? <laughs> no, no, I was like thinking 15. I was like, mm, what was I doing at 15? Yeah. I think, no, it definitely did impact on me and how I was though. Like, because I wasn't allowed to have a boyfriend until I was like, it was always kind of a boyfriend till 18. So I literally did not have an interest in boys for the longest time. I did yeah. not see them in that way, in that light. So you just accepted it? So I just accepted it. Um, was there any was there any stage where you wanted to push back or tempted to push back? I want to say yes. Not in terms of the boys thing, but like push me being a, just me being able to live my life. Yeah. But I also think it's just like um, just going through puberty. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a natural... <laughs> yeah. How do you combat that then? How do you combat the urges of just or suppress the urge to rebel? Or were you a rebel? Or did you cave? I was super moody. So that's why I'm, and I would just like yell and like, oh man, I love my parents. Like, and I wouldn't say I put them through hell, but I mean, like I definitely challenged them. But I mean, in terms of like, I don't know, the pressures of being Asian. Is that what you mean? Like, how did I... That's, I don't know, you have to rephrase that for me. So all those expect like, you, some of the things that you, you went through a strict upbringing, right? Yes. Relatively strict. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, do you, like, you felt sometimes the need to rebel, like, regardless of what it was, whether it was boys, whether it's, yeah, you got to do and well. you said some, some of it was strict, some of it wasn't. So you're saying that was all strict. Um, what would you say then isn't, wasn't strict? Like, do you, do you feel like, you had the ability to express yourself? No. The more that I think about it, the more I'm like, I am so suppressed. Like, I'm just <laughs> like, the more I'm thinking about it, I'm like, I think I'm very much like a, a do-gooder. I'm a goody-goody people pleaser. And now that I think about it, I think it's to do with my upbringing. Because yeah. my parents were strict. I just do as I'm told. Except when you yell at them. That was puberty. I, I'm going to pin that down to puberty. Pushing back, like, a lot of gaming and then like a lot of MSN and like no I'm not too gonna tell too many hours on MSN too many hours on MSN a lot of ASLs <laughs> ASL is almost the ever but Ever hotel <laughs> so so on that I mean we're only sort of uncovering a little bit now then you yeah. feel like maybe you were a little bit suppressed you feel like you were probably trapped I don't want to put these words in your mouth but no not trapped at all I think for me just because of how because of my upbringing the more I the more that we're talking about it now, the more I'm just realizing, like, it's probably shaped who I am today yeah. and why I am the way that I'm. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm sure you get, like, a lot of people who know me know that I, I can't help it, but I, I am the biggest people pleaser. I get along with everyone. I don't like confrontation. And I do think that that, yeah, that that does stem down to my upbringing. Yeah. And how the respect thing for my parents, how I... Sh- I guess how, yeah, they've raised me to be like, you need to listen to us. You have to do this. You have to do that. And I think that's why I just do as I'm told. And I'm a people pleaser and I don't like confrontation because I don't like getting into trouble. I will literally cry. If people yell at me, I cry. That's just my defense mechanism, I guess. So you never push back? I don't think I ever really push back. No, other than, again, puberty. But other than that, no, not really. And then, and then you say like a lot of your close friends from school who were of a similar upbringing, would you say that they would be quite similar to you in terms of the obedience? Sorry, guys. Don't want to throw anyone on the bus, but yes. <laughs> I actually think... Oh, well, it's, it's, I a, it's your think, perspective. Uh, no, uh, no we, we have talked... My friends and I have definitely talked about this before. We are all people pleasers. And as we're talking about this, I'm like, it could possibly be because of how we were brought up. Yeah, I think, I think we definitely... We've, touched on something um you're probably right like we're told to listen to your elders and do what you're told and so what See, i was told the same this? thing but the end product slightly different <laughs> not sure how that happened 
I also think you had it easy. You're like third generation South African. Your parents are pretty Western, like Westernized. So you're saying the Western is just loose. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys have it so easy? Well, I mean, nah. there's this degree to this, right? So maybe the Asian style of parenting is maybe a bit more rigid and aggressive. It is very rigid. Like if you don't, if you don't do what you're told, you, you get smacked. Or you have to sit in the corner or like. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. There's no such thing as um, like not naughty corners. Grounded. What does that mean? I never got grounded. That wasn't a concept for us to get. Is in it because you didn't break the rule? So no. You get grounded? If I mean the other time we ever my brothers and I got into trouble was when we would argue and we'd get smacked for it, and my dad would like or my dad would like sit in the corner like sit sit in the corner, like but we. Yeah, not grounded and things like that. We got punished for it. Yeah. And I didn't like that. And that's probably why I am a people pleaser and I can't deal with confrontation. Did you enjoy and that? <laughs> Sorry, just... the, the punishment? Or... Yeah, I'm like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> like the formal punishment. As in like looking There's back in retrospect. For... Do you think the consequences were, the consequences were... <laughs> appropriate nice. in hindsight what does that even mean no. <laughs> um i feel like there are better ways to parent now like people like no getting smacked and then not understanding why in hindsight again we'll we shouldn't have been arguing which my brothers and i but do we have to get smacked for it no Jeez. what about the for arguing did yeah you, did you get hit as a kid um up to a certain age, after I think after up to twenty, I hit thirty-seven, so maybe like thirty <laughs> years ago, <laughs> forty-five years. No, but you guys did right. Your parents, yeah, did. up till the age of ten. Then dad said, after a certain after there was one incident where he goes, "No, you're not getting smacked anymore," and then that was it. But yeah, no, keep going. The thing I was going to ask you was the authoritarian method of, I guess, raising a child. Yeah, you two obviously have two kids one boy one girl so you're gonna have uh you're gonna have some choices to make have yeah. you guys thought about what kind of thing you're going to do like parenting style yeah Not I, the- I, I can go first yeah okay. um for me my mom was not scared to discipline us physically let's put it that way and i don't i don't resent it or anything i think it was necessary because you yeah. got three sons you've got to have a line and it's got to be a very tight line otherwise boys they push the boundaries. Yeah. In saying that, I would prefer us not to take that route. Purely because I think, as Alex said, there's other ways to do it. It may not work. Yeah. But mm. it's something that I personally want to do. Yeah, like I think my, like, well, like our approach, mainly, like, well, my approach, I should say, like when I'm trying to discipline if my daughter, if she's like acting out or whatever, it's just trying to explain like why she can't do what she's doing, like explaining what... I'm deeming as naughty. Like why like why do I feel like that's naughty and she shouldn't do it? Does that make sense? So as opposed to like smacking her and then explaining it rather than try, like trying to talk it out. See, I like that, but, it, but that entails the child to have the intelligence or the awareness that they can understand what you're actually trying to tell them. Otherwise, is, it's just babble. Yeah. And they're just going to keep doing it. Yes. I mean, like, do I smack my daughter when she's like misbehaving now? Yes, I do. But Whoa. then, I, but I do explain. But I, it's just like a smack on the butt, like. But then I was like, she, la- she laughs when we hit her. She does. <laughs> so that's, and yeah, then I, it's, but I, it's, I get it. She's three. She's always three. She doesn't understand, right? Yeah. So I, I mean, like, there's so much I can do when she's three years old. But I smack her. So I'm like, don't do that. And then I explain. But I'm still my principle. My main principle is still talking her through why she shouldn't do what I think she's doing wrong. So, just a hash. Rehash. You guys mm-hmm. are sort of. You've got one way that you've grown up doing. You've seen other ways, and you are basically trying to wing it along. The, so I guess take the best of both worlds and wing it along the way. Yeah, yeah. and like, it's going to be tough, and we're going to mess it up, I'm no doubt. But to it. <laughs> at the end of the day, I think I, I've spoken to my mom about it, and she can. You know, when we when we have her on here, she can talk about it herself. But she says she does regret um, the amount of times that she hit us, um, and it's it's one of those things that you can't take You're that really time back. Really naughty. Well, yeah. Look, I, I'll be the first to admit, my Mark definitely deserved it <laughs> most of the time. Well, if you're most. running off 
hiding into bushes when you're meant to be going oh, to piano was, class. He was an absolute <laughs> like, piece of crap. But <laughs> me and Daniel, we didn't really get hit as much. So, yeah, yeah look, there's a time and place for it. But I think, yeah, I agree. I think there is a time and place. Um, but, yeah, there's just different methods. And we're just going to just see how we go, I think, as the time progresses. Yeah, but Charlie, I'm going to lay the hammer down. <laughs> Having your first beer at 12. Yeah, give me his beer. Beer. No, like he will not. Time. No. Um, okay, so then I've got one last question for you, Alex, mm-hmm. before I let Ethan take over. Um, if you could go back in time, and I'm not saying that, the, I'm not saying that, that you're not going to make this work. Maybe she won't make it work. But if you had to go back and try to talk reason with your parents, knowing what you know now, so like this is for the viewers who are potentially a little bit younger and thinking, oh, my parents are so jerkish. How would you how would you tell them communicate like this? I think so if that made sense. Yeah, I good. think it's like well again, like I said, I'm not good with confrontation, but that's to also that's probably to do with my communication skills. Hmm. So maybe like I would I wouldn't say confront my parents, but I'd probably sit them down and probably have a conversation with them like about how you know, like maybe explaining like why they should trust me. So for, okay, let's say for example, I'll put you in a specific scenario that yeah. might help. So Alex, you're not going to a sleepover at your friend's house tonight. You're too young. You're a girl. You're immature. I don't know what you're going to do. You're not going. Well, again, it's communicating with them and reasoning with them on like why I should, what are the benefits, I guess. Like it's just, it comes down to communication because like how I was brought up, it was you do as you're told and you don't talk back. If you talk back, it's considered rude. Talking back is rude. So I'd never talked back. I say never, but I got. Well, you had that phase, which we'll, we'll put it to adolescence. I say phase, but that's my defense mechanism. I, I really like that question, and like you said, it's you'd probably try to reason with them. It's I'm con- assuming that would go nowhere, based on what yeah, I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're strict. Like they're so strict in their ways and so rigid in their ways. So it would. I mean, if I was like. A nine-year-old trying to reason with my parents. I'd be like, no, you live under my roof. It's my rules. But I mean, like, maybe a better example would be me and Ethan going overseas for the first time together. Like I said, like, I would have to explain to them, like, why, you know, they should just trust me. And, like, what are their fears? Understanding what their fears are and why they don't want me to go. Like, understanding from their perspective. So you'd ask them, can you contribute to this conversation and then try to work it out from there? Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, good advice. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so then my, my last one before we do a little quick game, it's a two-part question. Yes. The first one would be, we now have a daughter. Yes. Are you? Do you feel that the style of parenting you had where it's kind of, we're making out like your parents are monsters, but they're not. They no, just, no, they no, just no, wanted no. to be, they wanted to, they wanted the best for you and they thought that's what it was. It's how they care. That's, that's their way of caring. Yeah. 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 So we've got Olivia. Would you think that that's the ideal way you want her, her to be raised? To a degree, yes. I know. I know, like, as you're, when you're a child and you're, like, going through it, you're like, oh, my parents are the worst, blah, blah, blah. But now that you're older, like, now that I'm older and I have my own daughter, it's like, to a certain degree, yes. I think how my parents were and how I see myself, I think that I'm, I like to think I'm a pretty decent human being. And it stems from how I was raised by my parents. So I would like the same for Olivia, but just change our ways of communication a little bit. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. And then the follow-up to that would be, do you feel that you missed out or you lost out in any way because of the restrictions? Like I know you didn't get to go to schoolies, um, no no sleepovers. I'm not saying sleepovers are the bomb. They were sick. They were sick. Always fun. Always fun. But you didn't get to do any of that stuff. Do you feel like you might have missed out? No, like not at all. School missing out in schoolies. I didn't have to go. Sc- funny story. I didn't have to go to schoolies, but I went overseas. <laughs> schoolies was a one-time thing. You can go overseas anytime. But that's no look. I that's that's an example yeah, of but something that you missed out because yeah. But it comes down to personality, right? And parties and things like that didn't appeal to me. So schoolies never appealed to me, and yeah. nor did it appeal to my friends. So having the friends that I had in high school, like my Asian friends. I think that that actually made me feel as though I wasn't ever missing out on anything at all. because yeah, That's really nice to hear. Yeah, because we were like... Refreshing. All in the same boat. 
like as a well, it, no, it's true, right? You you only it's it all goes down to again the stupid way we keep saying perspective. If everyone's not going, then you're not missing out at all. Yeah. yeah. Um. And yeah. Like, no, that's yeah. that's a good answer. Yeah. All right. Shall we get on to rapid fire? So, Alex, we're going to ask you a series of eight very cool questions. Uh, <laughs> we're going to go one at a time, and then the first thing that pops into your head, you can respond with. There are right and wrong answers, by the way. For right. example, would you prefer texting or calling? Calling. Do I have to explain why? No. No, summer or winter? Winter. Favorite city? <laughs> Brisbane. Favorite city? It's actually Paris. <laughs> yes, I thought so. I said Brisbane. Brisbane is not your favorite city. <laughs> yeah, Japanese or, even I knew that. <laughs> Japanese or Korean food? Damn, you know the answer to this. Japanese. <laughs> Friends or how I met your mother? Oh, friends. Forever friends. You say that with confidence, but I think you're actually more torn than your tone gives off. No, I love friends. I can Moving on. You friends. also like how I met I, I love both, but it's rapid fire. Which one? On, it's friends, on. okay? Unsub- actually, there's a thing that I've been wanting to ask, mm-hmm. and I strongly disagree with Ethan's answer, but in How I Met Your Mother, which character would you like an Ethan to? Oh. I mean, there's only three guys. There's only the um, Barney for sure. How? But not in terms of the Playboy aspect. It's just who goes, who cheers on the bad guys in all movies? They're always the coolest. That's why. No, <laughs> it's literally the Karate Kid, <laughs> oh. and you no, you bat for like the actual Karate he Kid. He is the Karate and Kid, I, and I also think at some stage in his life, his middle name was Suits. Suit up, always in suits. <laughs> always. Getting everyone to like get tailor made suits. Well, if you're gonna get it, you may as well make it fit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Sunset yeah. or sunrise? Sunrise. I know the answer to this one, but reality shows or documentaries. Can I have both? <laughs> don't even lie. You don't even watch documentaries. <laughs> no, my guilty pleasure. I love reality T V shows. Would you rather be, would you rather have the ability to pause time or rewind time? Definitely pause time. Why? Well, for me, there's nothing I would... I don't know. I'm so content with where I am in life right now that I want it to just last for as long as possible. So for me, I'd like to pause time and just be able to embrace it for as long as I can. That's what happens when you have me in your life. You want it to last forever. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, And then just the last one or two. For you, what's next? So you're going back to work soon. Maternity leave is over. The, the show is over. Hashtag early retirement is no longer early retirement. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, someone yeah, has to fund the bubble teas. Yeah. Is there anything? Is there anything feasible or not that you want to do in the next it's short time? So Asian. Now that I think of it, it's like open up my own bubble tea shop. Yeah, fair enough. That's I think cool. that's as Asian as I get. I love bubble tea. It's a lot of money in it. For what it's worth, <laughs> I think that you've sampled enough bubble teas to know <laughs> what, the market be research good. Has, has been done. It's more like a tax, like from a tax offset deductions perspective, flying overseas to try bubble tea. Well, we have the to dream? make sales to have deductions. But yeah, I know. You know. But uh, Look, I think Alex will buy enough of her own bubble tea to turn over a hefty profit. Yeah. There's yeah, so potentially business and obviously being with me, raising the kids. Yeah, it's just the kids. I think it's more being present as much as I can be with the two bobs and, you know. More adventures, traveling, hopefully. I love traveling. Yeah. Japan. Yeah, hopefully we can get get into some of that. Yeah. Um, and then I guess finally, is there anyone you want to thank besides me for being in your life? Thanks, Sam. <laughs> if your parents end up listening to this whole thing, no. I want to thank them yeah, on your course. behalf. Yeah, of course. I want to thank like my parents for just always being there, being really supportive. Like I'm really lucky because I do know I have it. Not going to lie, I do have a lot easier from the whole face and expectations perspective perspective mm. um compared to like other people that i know growing yeah. up in similar situations and then also probably thanking your parents as well yeah because they're also Definitely. very understanding they're always there for us and it's really nice to see like they like that um just how they are with accepting yeah. me and like raising you guys i guess you we're guys very fortunate to have both sets of grandparents which you know i never had um you didn't either yeah. So, yeah, we're very lucky to have them. Yeah, but I also never had grandparents. But thanks for including me. Well, 
It's like, can I shout out to my friends? I love my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them to actually listen to this. Yeah, guys, can you guys? If you get to, to this part, <laughs> yeah. Sam's gonna buy you a McFlurry. <laughs> no, honestly, I feel like if it wasn't for them, I would have had a totally different. Like, I don't even know where I'd be. Yeah. Like I, you know how you guys asked me that question about, um, like, if I felt like I was missing out on anything, maybe I would have if I hadn't met them. But so, what you had was enough. Pardon? But what you actually had was enough. <laughs> I don't know. Alex? I'm just going to end it there. Thank you for popping onto our show. Thanks. It was a pleasure having you. And Ethan sends his deepest and warmest regards and thanks. Thank thanks. And a little bit of appreciation. Thanks. Yep. <laughs> Thank you for listening. And we hope you enjoyed today's installment of Growing Up Bananas. Follow us on socials to stay up to date at Growing Up Bananas. And goodbye.